Welcome to the Friends with Money podcast, brought to you by Money Magazine, creating financial freedom for Australians since 1999. Hi, everyone. I'm Michelle Baltazar, the Editor-in-Chief of Money Magazine. And for today's episode, I'm excited to share that we have a very special guest, someone who I have admired as an artist, performer, and just an all-around superstar for many years. Incredibly accomplished, she scored 13 Platinums, 8 Gold, and multiple ARIA Awards and nominations. We are actually talking to her while she's on the road for her sweet inspiration tour zigzagging across the East Coast of Australia. Uh, But in fact, she's at the Hayman Island right now. So there you go. Something to add to your bucket list. Now, I know that she, in fact, needs no introduction, but a big warm welcome to this episode, Miss Kate Sobrano. Hi, Kate. Hello. Hi. How are you? I'm really good. We've literally just arrived in what is heaven, really. What can I say? It's um, an exquisite part of the the world. I've been up here once or twice before um, doing Getaway and a variety of other travel shows through the Whitsundays and actually was here just before the cyclone hit Hayman and I'm just seeing for the first time how the the spaces have been restored and improved and uh, just it's completely gorgeous up here. I can actually see the the sun the sunlight streaming into yeah. your your hotel room. It looks it looks really nice. So maybe uh, I would love to visit there come Christmas, perhaps uh, for uh, for holidays. Um, s- speaking of which, I feel like um, we haven't seen you for a while. I mean, because of of COVID, uh, a lot of things have happened, and certainly uh, the music and entertainment industry kind of. Uh, ground to a halt, if you like. So can you tell our, our, our readers, so what, what have you been up to? So how did you spend kind of being in this forced um, lockdown, if you like, for the past two years? So uh, the lockdown came and it was severe, as you can imagine. So in the first three to four months, we were very optimistic and the artists always come through with opportunities to solve problems which other people may not necessarily conceive of. I knew that there'd be some troubles in my business. My industry would would not be able to support itself. And I went and had a meeting with a couple of businessmen I knew and I said, do you mind giving me a um, an advance or a float that would be like a sort of benefit? for my musicians because I, I I could foresee it could go as long as three to six months. I would never have expected it to have lasted two, two and a half years. I certainly never would have imagined it could have been as rigorous as it was in Victoria. And so I asked my friends and they said, listen, we actually can't because um, by law, you know, we're not a fundraising community. So there's really no tax benefits for helping. I was thinking, oh my God, right now, I just don't need this conversation. We just need your help. You know, all the musicians and I had just been before lockdown helping flood relief, drought relief, and quite literally had spent tens of thousands of dollars helping other people in need. And I was like, who is going to show up for us? I wasn't eligible for the, the government handouts at that stage to help the musicians. So Thankfully, just before lockdown, a friend of mine moved into our property and had moved into like a beautiful new student apartment we'd built at the back of our house. And together, the two of us started broadcasting from home and we started Kate and Friends. It it was more like Kate and Friend. (laughs) Uh, My husband shot it and my daughter was in the house, of course, and helping and doing all of the... um, the, the promotion and singing as well and uh, we would edit it and we'd go live every Friday night and that just kept us going for at least a good year. Actually, you've touched a sore point there because I have a lot of friends who are singers and theatre performers and it was heartbreaking that they weren't eligible for any of the government concessions or even that temporary relief. And I was gobsmacked that, you know, suddenly all my friends lost their jobs, like in a split second. If that happened to me, I was a journalist. And then tomorrow someone said, Michelle, we don't need you right now because there's a crisis. But by the way, we cannot support you financially. What do you do next? So it, it was an incredibly terrible time and even now uh, I'm, I'm sure you know like in New York where Broadway theater 
productions would open and close because half of the the um, performers have COVID and the production crew have COVID as well. So I can see how incredibly mentally exhausting it would have been then. Thinking of your crew, your musicians, your band, you know? Yes. You know, when 40 years of being in a business and you are, in a sense, an infrastructure which others can rely on every week, three to four shows a week, it keeps their family fed, they have modest incomes generally, maybe a mortgage, maybe not. Everything to do with the arts is quite often reinvested into future projects. So we, we're self-employed, we're entrepreneurs and we're also risk takers and this is where a risk like being in the arts doesn't pay off because there's nothing to actually comfort or support you. And if you've got new children, a lot of my friends had just been having babies and and they'd moved out of town and perhaps taken on leases on places which they would only have been able to afford if they were working. The young girl that I had in the first part of my lockdown series, which was called Kiara and Kate, she had just landed an enormous role as a chorus line for Moulin Rouge and um, I believe another big musical which had had to be cancelled. So effectively she would live on her own in a small apartment with no income and uh, with no artistic expression, nowhere to go to go to class, nowhere to keep up her fitness, nowhere to train with other ballerinas. I mean, this is the um, the re- this is the the makeup of some significant uh, trauma, actually. And so Kiara came. We were able to kind of, well, we didn't break any rules, but she'd enter through the back garden gate and then we'd meet outside. So officially she never ever came to my house. And the two of us would do these funny little step classes and fitness classes and and she'd do choreography with me and and I was able to sort of blow her horn and blow wind up her and say, you know, guys, this is a dancer. She's like an elite automobile, you know. You've got to keep this engine going because... If it's not revved up to 11 every day, then to get it started again is an impossible task. And she's lived her whole life to do this. I'm, I'm the same as well. I mean, I've got to be honest, getting going again and in the catch-up COVID concerts that we've been doing, you know, I'm, I'm constantly challenged to, to get back to where I was. We were all on quite a high just before COVID hit, but we're nearly there. We're nearly there, exactly. Yeah, I had a funny thing that happened after about a year of lockdown, actually, uh, where we'd been broadcasting for many months and we'd raised quite a bit of money for Support Act, which was a, a fundraising unit to help those in critical need, um, literally for food, to feed their families. But when I knew that it was going to continue, I lost all heart to sing and I didn't want to sing anymore, actually. I didn't want to broadcast from home anymore. So I started painting. The network of fans was so remarkable that they all joined together and they sort of, they converted their love from, (laughs) it's really beautiful, I could cry when I think about it, but they converted their love and support from our concerts and live concerts into the art and they started to purchase pieces of their own and some of them own several pieces and and they'll probably start swapping and changing it sometime soon you know they've all been collecting these these sort of objects called my unsung songs yes and and i i followed the your journey uh, on instagram where you were signing some of your um prints as well would yeah. you consider this is a little bit random but would you consider having them as nft items like non fungible token Prince? Absolutely. Yeah, I've been doing a lot of research. Kathleen, who is my guitarist and, and again, my um, partner in crime when I was describing Kate and Friends, because she moved into our house before lockdown and then unfortunately or fortunately, which way, which way she wants to look at it, she got locked in with me for two and a half years. And like I'm like a creative vortex. Uh, she says that's fine. <laughs> but be- we became business partners and Kathleen has been teaching all through lockdown, so she's been working. She never stopped working, which is a remarkable a remarkable thing for a girl of 25, 26, really. And, you know, often six and seven students each and every night. She's an astonishing human. And she taught me um, how to organise in the same way that she's organised as a teacher, I imagine, what she has to show and 
represent to the school with every month that passes. You know, they have school reports and they have to do fiscal reports and they have to show how their value has been spent because they go then back to the parents. And so we started to get quite organised with the art And now she's done a lot of research. She's continuing to do some research with me on NFTs. And we hosted a a very, very interesting interview with someone who's right in the middle of it in California at the moment. We went through all the nomenclature of non-fungible tokens and um, all the different uh, degrees of entry points. We looked at the different websites that they're entering, Web3, I think now, which is an entirely new infrastructure of exchange and will have in itself more currency. So, I mean, we're definitely talking in ways that I, I would never have discussed <laughs> as a musician. It, my goodness, I do feel I'm talking to the businesswoman right now rather than the musician. I mean, you're you're. Uh, I feel like you're about to tell me about tax deductions and how you've yeah. set it up <laughs> and the trust. Well, actually, and- it's interesting you should say that because before COVID, In all of my career, I've never, ever been able to or eligible to get tax deductions for my costumes. And it would be this random arbitrary thing which you had to sew your name into the clothes. You had to put it through some sort of like accredited sort of system of costumier where, you you know, they they had to make a note of when you wore it and that you only wore it for that purpose and you didn't wear it anywhere. I was like, you know, my life is actually very simple when I'm not on the stage. So everything I live for is for stage. Every aspect of my shopping, every aspect of my acquiring wealth is only to go and reinvest in myself as an entrepreneur to then go out and create more art. So, you know, as a painter or as a musician, we spend thousands of dollars every year on musical instruments. We spend thousands of dollars every year on on personnel, on wages, and I cannot make my clothing tax deductible. And it's just been like, this is insane. This it, it, this needs to be discussed at the elections. I mean, yes, I totally, totally agree. you know what? I, well, I, I also have, I have to spend money for work outfits for big events, right? And they're expensive. And I'm like, I would never buy that. I would rather go to Kmart and buy a $50 t-shirt, but I have to buy a presentable outfit, but it's not tax deductible. Do you know, the thing is too, you, you and I in finance, like let's get down to the nitty gritties. If an artist, to some people who don't understand art and it's a visual thing for them, if they're sitting in the audience and they've paid $300 for a ticket, and they're wearing Gucci, so their outfit is, let's face it, no less than $3,000, including her bag and shoes. That's the non sequin yeah. version, right? And that's the non sequin version. And they don't want to see you up there improvising with a Peter for Kmart. I mean, with no disrespect to any designer. I try to wear Australian designs and I try to be really true to it. But we don't have per capita the kind of culture that can assist a musician or artist who's trying to create this amazing emotional impact with fashion. Yes. And there is no connection. There are no designers. There's no one for whom you can talk with. Um, It sounds like you're begging when you're asking for a media commission and I just don't like to do it. So I own everything I wear, which is outrageous. I hate to ask, but if you would like to, to overshare, how much do you spend on dry cleaning a year is the question on a, a busy concert year. Well, it costs equal to what the dress is worth every time you have to get it done. And so if, let me just name some very high-end and beautiful Australian labels because I am a very big advocate for Australian culture, fashion, music. Um, Some of the labels I wear, which I adore, are Zimmerman, Nevenka, uh, Aj, Camilla and Mark. And these these are people who will have only two and a half percent of their range inaccessible to the general. So usually you buy as a trunk show something that was offered on a catwalk and then they make one or two, but only one to two of each size. That's it. And those garments are never less than two and a half thousand dollars each. And then to, to clean them after a concert, and let's face it, you're not going to be concerned when you're on stage on a 70 minute set and you're playing drums, keys, and singing and shouting for two and a half hours, 
you're not worried about the condition of the dress actually, to be honest. You have to perspire, you have to breathe. They have to be worn and they have to be, you know, worn carelessly so that no attention, you're not preserving the garment. You are actually using the garment to express yourself. And in actual fact, I would say that garment is only worthy of three to five shows maximum and then it has to be put down. My goodness, you have the makings of an accountant, Kate. You're even looking at return on wear on these outfits. Now, I want to talk about what you said. All my, I've got to teach all my artists that I live and work with how this, <laughs> how this works, you know. <laughs> you know, you, you, you learn from the best, then you learn from the best. Now, uh-huh. you did you did touch on a on a very sensitive topic here, which is how does Australia support the arts and entertainment industry, especially because you're the first industry to sh- lend your support whenever there's a natural disaster. And now we're coming back and I'm really excited to see that you're on the road, you're performing. <laughs> how does it feel to be, you know, back with your team, back with your crew? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, you have to be very nimble as a businesswoman. If you're in leadership on any level, you know that there's a, there's an internal squad that are always going to be your forever squad. And then there's the next tier outside of that, which is the peripheral, they're the unit you use when you can afford to use them. And then beyond that, then there's the industry at large, which is something you can only ever really confidently plug into if you've got a future attached to it. So working backwards from that, right? This week we've had to work with a duo, a trio, a quartet, a quintet, and add three horns. And each one comes with a different price and each one has different travel travel concerns. And all of the artists are coming from different states of the country. Qantas have just increased their, their, their prices because they put off so many stuff. Mm. And we're traveling on a on an airline that doesn't allow any baggage. So, so on the so for what we one, what we're gaining on one hand, we've lost in the other, and this takes an enormous amount of coordination. It takes a lot of patience because you also have to be able to deliver without having as many of the inner sanctum of your team available. But I can't afford to put anyone off either, because like Qantas, look at Qantas now they're going to have to charge so much more and deliver so much less that they won't be regarded with the same affection as they've always had. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think if you want to deliver quality, you have to always give more than people expect. It's just a standard rule of business. It's just you must you must be prepared and willing to to offer more than what people thought you were going to give. And we've tried to do that. This week we've had, like I said, all that variation of a theme We've played to small golf clubs in Mansfield, to Byron Bay festivals, to 5,000 people out in the Broken Hill in the desert. We've come back and played in small peninsula hot springs. And, you know, it's a bonfire of the vanities, darling. You just have to say you are who you are and you can be put in any configuration and you'll still be you. And in the end, isn't that the value of a good product. I mean, in the end, one can only hope that that product is something that can't, it's irreplaceable. And I'd like to think somehow there's a part of me now that can't be un-Kate sobrano There is no way un- Sir- Kate Sobrano could be un-Kate sobrano uh, You're <laughs> one, you're one in a million. And I totally know what you mean about budgets and and still providing a spectacular program because you, you, essentially music elevates the mind and the spirit yes. and after covid people need a lot of that a lot of that encouragement we didn't even talk about mental health uh, you touched a little bit about that but even with money magazine we know that mental health is directly linked to yes, financial yes, health yes. as well yes because if money equals security then if somebody would feel that they were no longer secure in doing what they maybe are only able to do that one singular thing, which to a greater or lesser degree, that's why my business has been self-perpetuating because it's the one thing I feel strongly I can do. I don't try to go outside of the lines and I didn't intend to reinvent myself with art. That just happened accidentally. Um, my prime, my prime 
currency, if you will, is 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 song. Mm. And I'm glad because of my F- Filipino heritage, uh, I happen to be a warm person. And I think that's a very Filipino characteristic. And very resilient. Now, I feel like you're ready for this question, Kate. Are you ready? Oh, okay, I am going to ask you about cash flow. Cash oh, okay. flow. All right. Okay, so... Are you telling money listeners right now that cash flow is important, especially as an artist, and just making sure that you know you balance your expenses and your profit and cash? Yes. <laughs> She's laughing. She she is my source of cash flow. So just <laughs> I'll tell you what I think is a sensible idea, and I'll tell you how I stray from it and how I play with it. Okay. So first of all, essential to all business is reserves. You've got to have reserve accounts or someone who is in charge of that that takes money away from you without you seeing it. <laughs> whether that's whether it's a bank, whether it's a person, whether it's your husband, whether it's your wife, whether it's some you need to have someone who's looking into the future and has a set aside. And then that goes into the things that keep our lives secure, like delivery points, car, house you know, the things that count, or at least if you can't own a house or you can't own a car, you can at least have an investment in the music equipment, for instance, for me and my delivery point, I could own that. I feel like I'm talking to an accountant at the moment. Sorry, I don't mean to talk like this. It's it's just, I know it's the things I've just learned in 40 years. I'm sorry. If it's boring, (laughs) it's not. No, Um, no, it's not. It's not boring at all. I'm just surprised. I'm really... Well, I do too. Pleasantly surprised. Very uncommon, okay. And this is where I fudge the rules a bit and I kind of have to do this just to have a bit of fun. But I I always make sure that we've got enough for tax set-asides because, again, the tax is not friendly for artists and um, in many ways we have more scrutiny than most because you're a famous person. Uh, they'd love more than anything to use an example to someone else and say that this person had evaded taxes and is a terrible way to ruin a person's reputation, especially a well-loved person, if an artist were to be someone really familial and really well-known, and then it's implied that they've done something illegal which no other Australian is allowed to do or get away with. We all expect celebrities to misbehave on those sorts of things. So I'm, I'm like really determined never to find myself walking on that edge. And so set-asides, tax-asides, we put them all aside. The thing I do that's uncommon is I only give myself a tiny, teeny wage a week, like literally a couple of hundred bucks in my savings account. Um, And then I have a daily limit on my credit card. (laughs) And then if I'm really in trouble, I borrow from my (laughs) mum. Love but, it. The bank so, of mum and dad. Oh, honestly. And it's it's just such, it keeps me feeling young and a little bit silly. But in truth, it keeps me safe because I see young women today, you know, they don't control their spending and they don't control their credit. And they think that somehow, somewhere, someone's going to take care of that. But independence and um, responsibility comes with self-discipline. And you can only really, really, in the end, uh, be a better you if you're checking off those things. Are you responsible? Are you self-disciplined? And and are you working? Do you deserve treats? Mm. We had to do a lot of things in COVID to cut costs, just so you know that I think every, um, and I haven't done all of that alone. I've had a team of, of financiers and um, management that have been family and friends and I've worked with for over 25 years now. Um, my husband and I had to combine our lives. My husband's a director, a film director and a corporate um, commercial director, but all of that went away. Every single bit of it went away in COVID. So mm. no income from two streams, bang, gone. So um, just on a second side note and the last note, which I think you'll appreciate, my stepmother who married my dad is Filipino. And she is the head of the um, Master Quilt Association in the Philippines. And so when all the chips were down and I was creating these art pieces, I asked her to help me create an alliance with the Master Quilters of the Philippines 
and I had them make my designs into beautiful hand sewn quilts as legacy pieces. And I and I I have a small business now which I run with my guitarist and we make these heritage legacy pieces. It's very Filipino. <laughs> And, and that's it. my backup. That's my backup. When all else fails, do something with your hands and your heart. You have diversified. You've diversified your business. You've gone global as well. What's the best investment advice you've received? I think personally, for me, the successful action, this is very small fry. It won't suit most people. But love and live in the property that you invest in. And then make it something that is exceptional to you it has comfort it has beauty and then people tend to love it like every house I've had two houses now where people will come in off the street and they're just modest homes and just give me an indecent proposal for it like just because the garden's in a way that's that's very unique or or it feels loved or there's some sentimental value to the way you've restored it or the way you live in it people come in and go I have always wished to live my life like this you know so mm. that's my thing. I think that if you have it in you, and, and not everyone does, but love and live in your home and make it beautiful and others will see the value in it and then you can then move from there and extend your conversation with other objects. Though to be frank, Kate, I live in Sydney. I don't even have to do that. I can have like a, a fiber shack and people will still offer two million bucks for it. That is actually a very interesting point. Sydney is so different it, it as as a character as an identity my mother-in-law is incredible with property in sydney uh she is just she's a gun she must but be she's killing not it. sentimental like me she just does she says oh kate you're so sentimental <laughs> okay next question second last question uh what is inflation inflation is an idea created by governments to keep the people down <laughs> I feel that is that is closer to the truth, even if you jest. <laughs> and finish this sentence. Money makes. Money makes your dreams uh, a lot easier to realize. Makes it make yeah, it makes it easier for you to realize your dreams. Um, but money is only an an idea backed by confidence. I once read, which I thought and I agree with very very clearly. It's an idea backed by confidence. So for me, it should mean that there is confidence in me and I have confidence in others when we use it to exchange our products with each other. Amazing. Kate, you've been generous with your time. This has been a fantastic interview. Thank you for joining Friends With Money today. I hope you got something out of it. You'll probably be like, you know, someone who reads someone's handwriting. You'll have got my personality down to a T. I feel like you've just gone and done, you've done an, you've done an, an analysis on me. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I am going to lobby for tax deductibility of costumes. That's my goal. Yes, please. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the Friends With Money podcast. For credible, independent and easy to understand financial commentary, visit moneymag.com.au. Please remember that the views and opinions expressed in this podcast are general in nature and further independent advice and research based on your personal circumstances should be sought before making an investment decision.